minutes after two. So uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's event, a discussion on commercial real estate in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, my name is Gabe Bolio, and I'm a member of the Career Programs team here in the Office of Alumni Relations. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Boston University Alumni Association and is offered to our 339,000 alumni around the globe. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to welcome our many current BU students who are joining us today, as well as alumni from all over the world, from places like Hong Kong, Tel Aviv, Madrid, uh, and all the way back to the States, uh, to places like Pasadena, San Diego, San Francisco, Austin, Texas, Chicago, Asheville, North Carolina, Cartersville, Georgia, Miami, Bethesda, Philadelphia, Portland, Maine, West Hartford, Connecticut, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and dozens of places around Massachusetts and in the Boston area. So thank you for coming out today. A few housekeeping things before we start. If you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of today's presentation, please contact Zoom support directly at the number displayed at the bottom of your screen. Uh, that number is 1-888-799-9666. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available for on-demand viewing on the Alumni Association website, which you can find at bu.edu slash alumni. If you have questions for our speakers today, you can submit them throughout the presentation by typing them into the Q&A box. To find the Q&A box, mouse over your Zoom screen to reveal the toolbar at the bottom, then select Q&A. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our moderators for today's program, who will in turn introduce you to our alumni panel. Two very familiar faces to many of you. Our first moderator is Rick Rostoff. Rick is Vice President of Acquisitions at Linear Retail Properties and a graduate of the Questrom School of Business. He's joined today by Keith Munsell. Keith also earned his MBA from BU and is head of the real estate concentration and a master lecturer at the Questrom School of Business. It's wonderful having you both here with us today. And uh, with that, I turn the floor over to you. Well, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, second what Gabe said and welcome all of you. Um, <coughs> it's wonderful. We have over 250 participants today. Um, now, Gabe said this is the real estate uh, alumni network, but I'm going to define that ever so slightly, narrow that, and say it's the BU Real Estate Network that is presenting this today. In the Boston area alone, we have over a thousand alumni. So getting 250 people to this event is really quite a, quite a uh, strong showing. And many thanks to Rick and Gabe for making this happen. Now we're very fortunate today to have four great panelists and one great moderator, all of whom are affiliated with BU. Now I know this because I had Vin in class, I had Mike in class, and I had Rick in class um, just a few years ago. And in the past, Sandy has been kind enough to come in and guest in my development class. And Paul is a former panelist on one of our earlier BU networking events. So welcome all. I guess this is the new normal. And I hope sometime in the future, in the near future, we can get back to the former normal. But here at BU, just for you guys to know, that we are planning to open in the fall, but we also have contingency plans in case the virus is not under control. I'd like to give one current comment from Boston Business Journal and then turn it over to Rick. And I found this interesting, this current event at a Boston Business Journal. This says Walsh mulls a reopening of construction. Now, for those of you who aren't from this area, Walsh is the mayor of Boston. But what I found fascinating here was in mid-March, he became the, the mayor of the first large city to fully shutter construction. This was to me the interesting fact. The decision halted 97 projects with more than 21 million square feet of, of space in Boston, Somerville, and Cambridge. I had no concept that we had 21 million square feet under construction. But I know our panelists knew that. So without further ado, Rick, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, thanks for once again coordinating and putting us all together. Um, so I'm going to just start off by introducing the four panelists we have today. 
Uh, our first panelist is Vin Norton. Uh, Vin is a principal of Urban Meritage. Um, his company has been involved uh, with different types of acquisitions in the Newbury Street corridor. Um, he first started out with an acquisition of 28 properties um, in the joint venture that he sold in 2011 for $227 million. Uh, then he put together another joint venture where he acquired 12 buildings on Newbury Street for approximately $160 million. Uh, and then Vin went off Newbury Street a little bit and he bought the first floor of the Hotel Commonwealth um, in 2014. Uh, for about $39 million, and they rebranded that as Kenmore Row, and that's uh, also one of his projects now. Um, also with us is Sandy Silk. Uh, Sandy is um, a principal of uh, Jefferson Apartment Group, which is based in Virginia. Uh, they own over 10,000 apartment units throughout the East Coast, and they have another 2,500 units under development, uh, including in their Boston Holdings, are the 289-unit City View at Long, Longwood, the 158-unit J Highlands in Hudson, Mass, and their newly developed uh, J in Malden Center, which is 320 units, um, along with uh, 23,000 square feet of retail. Uh, CND has been involved in the development of over 1,500 multifamily units around the Boston area, including Archstone, Boston, Common, Avalon, and North Point in Cambridge, and the Arlington 360 in Arlington, Mass. Uh, Paul Landano, Paul is the head of real estate department at the law firm of Choate, Hall and Stewart. Uh, prior to Choate, he worked over at Brown Rudnick. Uh, Paul has over 20 years of experience in real estate law, representing landlords and tenants and lenders throughout New England. And Paul was a valued member of the Boston University football team while he was attending BU. Go Terriers. And lastly, uh, we have Michael Chase. Uh, Michael Chase is a managing director in North Mark's Boston office. Um, he's involved with financing. Um, in his 20 year career, he has financed over $2 billion worth of debt and equity uh, for commercial real estate assets. And prior to North Mark, uh, Michael worked for Q10 New England Realty Resources. Okay. Uh, just for a little introduction from myself. Oh, first of all, I work for Linear Retail Properties. We're an owner operator of uh, small to medium sized retail properties throughout New England. We own approximately 96 retail properties, including about 20 buildings in downtown Boston. But in the market in general, um, I've been on a lot of conference calls and webinars lately, and I'm just going to go over a little info of what I've accumulated. I'll tell you that, and then we'll start asking some questions of our panelists. Um, so far, everything I've heard has been that industrial assets have really done the best. Um, for the most part, for the April collections, people in industrial buildings have collected over 90% of their rent. Um, the next two assets that were up there are office and multifamily, which have generally fared well through, through April. Uh, and from one hearing, they're all collecting 80% uh, or more of their April rent. Uh, retail has been tough, as most of you know. I've spoken with pretty much every other large land, retail landlord around Boston. And in the New England area, um, about 50% of retail rents were collected for the month of April. So that means 50% weren't collected, which is a lot of big amount. Um, then it's even worse when you get outside of New England. Uh, I was speaking this week with uh, two developers that own stuff on a nationwide basis, and both of those have so far collected about 20% of their rent for the month of April. So things aren't that great. But if you think that's not that great, then we get to hotels. As you know, most hotels are even closed or working minimally for people that need to be there, and uh, <clears throat> they're operating at 20% or less and definitely losing money. All right, so first we're going to ask some questions from Vin Norton. So Vin, how have your properties fared during this uh, past six weeks period? I think consistently with, with what you just described. I, I'd say that the, you know, our buildings are mostly mixed use. Uh, there are some single tenant retail assets, but the, the, the properties that have office, uh, non-retail upstairs, office or apartments, um, the, the, the 
uh, April collections went well with those, uh, consistent with what you've been hearing. Uh, retail a little bit less so. We're probably close to 75% across the portfolio for collections. Um, and every building and every tenant is, is a, different, a different case. Um, we're, we're working with everybody. Um, we're working with our lenders and we're trying to come up with best solutions for those that are struggling more than others. Can I so is it, get something here, Ricky? Sure. Uh, ben, what, what are your projections for May? Since, you know, April was kind of the beginning of this and we didn't know where we would stand and now we know where we stand uh, with an uncertain future. What are you projecting in May? Similar collections or do you think they will be down? May will most likely be down, um, again, case by case. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the government stimulus programs that are, that are in place. So, so the, the tenants that have been able to apply for, get approved, and get funded on PPP loans would have that extra, extra funding to, to pay for April, May, June rent. Um, but it, again, case by case, May is going to be a little bit more difficult, not for the apartments, uh, maybe less so for the office, but for the retailers that truly have been closed, it's going to be just more challenging. Thank you. Now, Vin, um, I've heard that national tenants were being more demanding than local tenants, and local tenants were being a little more communicative. Um, have you found that to be the case? From a communication standpoint, we have heard from everybody. Um, you know, we've, we have not been the recipient of a letter that just says, dear tenant, we're not paying rent, um, which I know a lot of the mall uh, type landlords have received. So. We've been in communication with everybody. Um, the, I think that there hasn't been much of a difference between the nationals and the locals. Um, everyone has different stories. If, if there is a request for relief, then the biggest, you know, the first thing on our end is, you know, show us your financials. Show us where the sales have dropped off. Let's, let's kind of dig in together um, as a starting point. Okay, great. Um, now, will you are focused on the Newbury Street area? I know that Newbury Street is kind of different block per block. Um, have you found that certain parts of Newbury Street are faring better than the others, or is it pretty consistent up and down the area? Today it's consistent because they're all closed. So, so from block to block, it's all the same. Um, you know, taking, taking out the apartments and, 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 and office, let's say. But, but from a retail standpoint, quite consistent block to block. When things reopen, it'll probably be a different story. Um, um, I think that there are typically stronger tenants from a financial standpoint on, on some of the blocks, you know, kind of first, second block, third block, last block. Um, and so I think that we might see a different story when folks are reopening, um, but really tough to predict right now. And uh, I haven't been to Newbury Street in a long time because of this scenario, um, have many restaurants, Newbury Street, been doing takeout? And have you seen many people going there? So um, truth be told, I've also been working from home, uh, which is about 16 miles due west of Newbury Street. So I also have not been in there. My business partner lives a few blocks away from the office, so he's there every day. Uh, yes, a handful of restaurants are doing takeout. Um, uh, Capitol Grill, I know for a fact, I've uh, been checking in with those folks and they're, they've, they've got a pretty good takeout business happening right now. Um, nothing can substitute for reopening. Um, and so, you know, obviously we encourage everybody to take advantage of, you know, helping out the local restaurants, but um, um, it really is, a lot of restaurants looked at it and said, I, I, I can't make this work. I can't, I can't kind of staff a kitchen um, and, uh, you know, front of house and, and, and make this work. So I'm going to just shut down. We have a few restaurants in the in Kenmore Square, Kenmore Row, um, and of the three restaurants, one uh, called Suru Tantan, which recently opened, has continued with the takeout business. So we're, we're pleased with that. The other two have not been able to. They've, they've been closed. Yeah. Well, a major part of that too is, uh, you know, especially for urban restaurants, a lot of the profit comes from this alcohol sales. So just opening for takeout is not that profitable. Um, so I think that's one thing. That right. I mean, I know a lot of the municipalities have, have, have um, um, lightened the regulations allowing restaurants, you can walk into the Capitol Grill and buy some steaks and buy some wine. Um, so that helps, 
but um, um, again, we just you know need need to get everything reopened. Okay. And um, last question: uh, What type of tenants do you think will come back the quick quickest? Are those the tenants um, like Suit Supply and Indochino that have an omni-channel presence? Um, are they you know already doing some sales, just not through the stores? Yeah, I mean, when I spoke on a panel, I think you moderated it uh, last fall over at BU, I, I, I spoke a, a bit about um, the tenants we've been trying to attract, the direct-to-consumer type tenants. So I'll, I'll, I'll pick on uh, Allbirds, for instance, um, uh, a company that starts on the internet, has strong sales, knows their customer, knows their product. And then they say, well, we want four or five half dozen locations around, around the country or the world. Uh, I think they'll open quite strong. Uh, one of the reasons why they have the, uh, the real estate presence would have been for today. They, they, they announced today uh, a new product line, a, a running shoe for Alberts. And so uh, the stores would have been a great place where they'd have lines out the door to, re to, to introduce the new products. Um, and so that strategy remains, it's just can't happen right now. But I think those direct consumer omni-channel uh, Patagonia, we, we have a, a property at the end of Newbury Street, at 346 Newbury Street, with uh, what we are told is the number one Patagonia store in the, in the, in the country. Um, they, they really know how to, you know, they, they continue selling online. And so therefore they'll be financially stronger than those that are truly closed without any online presence. I agree. Okay. Uh, before we go into our next panelist, Gabe, do you want to ask poll question number one of people on the call? Okay. Let's answer people on the um, call. Let's answer question, just get question one and two right now. And if you go and click it on, Hopefully it should tabulate, uh, we should see them tabulating as you come in. So that's everybody. Can everybody see the poll question if you can? It Click looks on like uh, you... they're starting to come in now, the, the tabs. Okay. I couldn't see it on mine, so. Gabe's in control of that. He's driving the bus. <laughs> Which we give it, Gabe, like a minute? Yeah, we'll give, uh, since there's, if people are answering several questions, we'll give them a couple seconds. Okay. It yeah, was we'll just questions. Should we do just questions one and two now or all of them? Um, I think folks are answering uh, all of them. I guess they have all popped up at the same time. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll give people a chance to read through them and answer, and then we can address them one by one. Okay. All right, so we'll give another uh, 20 seconds and then we'll uh, close the polls up. All right. And Rick, you're able to see the results on your end? Um, like if you click I the polls see. button at the bottom of the page, oh, okay. can you see the results? I think all of the panelists should be able to. Um, actually, I, I, I don't. Okay, that's all right. I'm happy to read them. Um, all right, so we're going to end the polling. Uh, so thanks for everybody who voted. Um, so the first uh, poll question were, which term best describes you? Uh, and other actually was our, our largest category with 52%, uh, followed by owner. 29% uh, of you are owners, 13% of you are brokers, and 6% of you answering were lawyers. Okay. Oh, is that for everybody now? I can see it. I can see that. Yes. Yeah, this should be active for everyone now. Okay. All right. And question two is the what type of recovery? Um, it looks like most people think it's going to be a U or a W. Um, we can talk about this a little later on. For those who don't know, the V shape would mean we go down fast. And come back up fast. The U shape means you go down. Um, we sit down there for a little while, and five months, six months, who knows, and then start coming back. The W is, I think, what we don't want. 
where we go down, come up, go back down into another recession, and then come back up again. Although it looks like most people think it's going to be U or W, and then um, <clears throat> other is a very small percentage. Um, if sit-down restaurants were opened by July 1st, how likely are you to dine out at one? And this uh, has me a little surprised. Uh, 30% is very likely. I thought that that was going to be like 10% or less. Uh, somewhat likely is 36%. That's our leader. And not very likely is 29%. Um, I think I would be in the not very likely category. Um, and last, if you question is, if you had a lot of investment capital, uh, where would you put it today? Uh, multifamily is our winner. Um, that's both good for you, Sandy. Um, industrial is second. Uh, office, retail, and other are all kind of uh, just hanging down there in below. So I think that's pretty interesting, like I said, especially the restaurants, because I still wouldn't feel comfortable going there. All right. So next, uh, we're going to ask some questions with Sandy Silk. Uh, Sandy, overall, how has the Jefferson um, apartment group portfolio held up over the past six weeks? And are some parts of the country uh, faring better for you than others? Um, great question. So we have, um, we own assets up and down the Eastern seaboard um, with a concentration in Florida, a concentration in the mid Atlantic and a concentration up here and also operate properties for other people's balance sheet. And what we found on, you know, kind of to speak a little bit to Vin's comments on collections and your earlier comments around 80%, what we found is uh, it, it's about 80% overall, but we have some properties that are in, um, we have one property right outside the main line on in the Philadelphia area that is a, in a very affluent sub, sub market where the vast majority of the tenant base is empty nesters um, and retirees based on where that is. That, that property had a very low delinquency rate um, this month or in, for April collections. And then other properties that serve a more of a millennial or more urban locations where there's a, a higher degree of service professionals in those um, buildings have had um, more requests for rent relief. And that's not really surprising if you think about it based on various folks' financial scenario. And to go to, um, I think it was Vin who mentioned this as well, every scenario is different. Um, we, we've been very much trying to lead from a place of starting, starting with humanity, right? Like try to understand what each person's issue is, um, what their challenge is and what their timing may be. Grad students, we've had grad students who um, live in some of our buildings who have left because they, their schools have closed. Um, some of them continue to pay rent um, even though they're no longer kind of technically occupying the unit at the moment. Um, we've had a few of them try to kind of in their lease early. But again, every situation is different. I would say we're, we're holding strong, um, but like everyone, the, the heavy focus is on rent collection and, and we're expecting, I would think that this month will be a little bit worse than, than last month. Um, it's also worth noting, we do have some retail in our mix um, and you know we're seeing exactly what Vin had noted. Um, but it's interesting, the, the more local groups are, are the ones that are now starting to come up as we approach May 1 um, for a little bit of rent relief. Maybe they're asking for relief on their CAM, not their whole rent. Um, so there's a lot of pride that those local operators really have. They don't want to fail. Um, and so, you know, for them paying their rent is the, it's the equivalent for a homeowner of you want to pay your mortgage, right? You want to be current. Okay. Are those mostly restaurants? Um, it's a mix of restaurants and fitness and um, some service. So, um, you know, our project in Malden, which is, you know, for those of you on listening in who aren't local to Boston anymore, um, it's a close in suburb uh, on the train line, um, kind of um, transit oriented development pro project, but it's an emerging um, location. And interestingly, we've had two of our retail tenants there, a wine and beer shop and a, um, and a yoga studio both start their retail fit up in the last inside of the last month um, in a brand new building. So the beer and wine shop can't wait to be open, right? He's going gangbusters in all his locations. And the yoga studio has been operating online, doing online classes. So you, you're really seeing a lot of pivoting 
from um, in the retail side. And there's a lot of pivoting happening on the multifamily side. Um, I chatted with our one of our leasing professionals earlier today, and she was relaying that the virtual leasing tour where literally our leasing agent is walking through somebody through a unit on FaceTime or Skype or some other or Zoom or some other um, system where they're able to walk through the unit has been super successful. And so things like that that we didn't typically do are now the norm and we're leasing units that way and leasing a good amount, not as many as we would normally lease at this time of the year, but still a very healthy amount. Okay. Yeah, that was my question to you because I know that your uh, Jay Malden is in its lease up phase. So I figured that that would be a very important component of how you, how you get that leasing done. Right. Uh, so it's virtual leasing is, is key. And then kind of globally uh, across our company, yeah. we, you know, literally our property management teams this week have a call about, you know, to share best practices for virtual leasing, um, sharing best practices for, you know, what are the, um, the kind of can tours that we have and video tours that have been produced in the last six weeks. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of items like that that aren't part of the normal leasing rubric that we typically do. It's a lot more drop in, a lot more folks finding us online and then scheduling an appointment to tour. But we're, I mean, interestingly, at, at that property we had five leases that week, um, last week, and we've held very steady around that number. Now, now that's lower than we should have at this time of the year, but in talking with our competitors across the market, that's that's kind of the high watermark for where people are right now. Um, because the, the leads that come in are highly qualified, right? If you're looking for an apartment on a virtual tour, you really need to move. Yeah. Now, are you only doing virtual tours or are you letting people come and physically look at the building? They're only doing virtual tours right now. Our leasing offices are closed except for by appointment. Um, there's a lot of social distancing measures in place, as one can imagine, in a multifamily building. There are a lot of touch points, the elevators, the stair rails, the entry doors, the mail, the mail situation. Um, so it's very, we're, we're trying to be extremely careful to um, provide spaces that are as clean and as sanitized as they can be. Um, and we re really rely on our tenants to be respectful of all of that as well. So having a lot of people come in for a tour is, is challenging. But people who have leased virtually are scheduling move-in dates, and we've had move-ins in the midst of this. So in terms of operations, have you had to have extra cleaning or extra people on to do clean the elevator buttons and different things like that? We've, we've definitely ramped up our cleaning across the board and that's, you know, our, our leadership on the property management side is participating in a lot of webinars like this with other leaders of other multifamily properties. I think everybody, one of the hallmarks of this time has been, um, I think, across the the board competitors really trying to share best practices to improve everyone's standing um, mm -hmm. because none of us can withstand a fear of um, kind of multifamily housing, right? You, we, we all need to make sure that people are being careful. So we've installed sanitizing, you know, sanitizer at the elevators um, and you know, upped, upped our cleaning regimens. Um, now, I know about four weeks ago, your company sold the 262-unit one Upland property in Norwood uh, for a pretty nice price tag of $104 million. Um, so you sold that still after the pandemic started. Um, were there any complications to that transaction because of what's been going on? Was it delayed or was due diligence harder to do or anything like that? That transaction was pretty fully baked at the time that all of the COVID restrictions started coming into place. So our timing was really good. Um, we didn't have that, that transaction bore no um, impact really from what's going on now. We are hearing, um, and I'm hearing from other development companies, that they are having, um, they are having issues, right? Like um, it's hard to conduct due diligence to buy an existing asset if you can't walk through all the units and nobody's allowing people to walk through their units for all the reasons we just discussed. Um, and, and I think that's true on the um, land development side too. Um, a lot of um, us uh, and my, you know, kind of colleagues slash competitors are doing, um, are, are pausing 
if you will. And it's more of a, um, it's a thoughtful pause is probably the best way to put it, where we're continuing to move forward on projects that are pretty well baked, have limited permitting risk, um, and are you know kind of further down the path. Things that are newer, um, we're reaching out to sellers and, and partners to buy time for the most part, because nobody knows what the next step is here. And nobody was certain, certainly when this started six weeks ago, how long this was going to take. And you know, sitting here today, I don't know that we, we have any more insight into just how long this is going to take. And last question, um, do you envision this current pandemic changing the way that you guys develop multifamily or mixed use properties in the future? Oh, that is the million dollar plus question, Rick. Um, I've been party to a lot of conversations lately about that. And I think it's, um, there's a lot of thought leadership to come in that particular um, kind of framework and thought. Um, some of the things we've started talking about are, you know, is, is there more of a need for co-working spaces than there has been in the past in multifamily buildings as it's likely that more companies will allow people to work from home? And what do those spaces look like? Are they communal? Are there, are there more, quote, breakout rooms? Um, what is that? Um, some of the stuff we've talked about in terms of leasing, is there more virtual leasing? Um, our leasing offices have often been very open spaces, as have our amenities. Um, the the question of what what happens in amenity spaces is is paramount. I think our today our amenity spaces are are um, all closed off. We're not allowing residents to access any of those amenity spaces because it's too hard to keep them clean um, and too hard to manage, you know, effective social distancing. Think of it as the same reason all the playgrounds and basketball hoops and stuff have been closed off. Um, but that's not a long-term situation. I think it also speaks to how, how accessible are your outdoor spaces? How accessible are you to the outdoors in general? Um, and certainly walkability and, and access to places is important. So it's, we don't have the answer yet, but we're having conversations with a lot of folks and, and there, will be, there will be impacts. Yeah, I think there are a lot of things today that don't have answers to them, so we'll have to see. All right, next we're gonna move on to Paul. Um, Paul, we know you represent a lot of large landlords, tenants, lenders. Um, who are you hearing the most from today and what type of questions are you getting? Um, thanks, Rick. Um, well, in terms of questions, I think the, you know, the initial onslaught of questions um, from owners and tenants uh, was along the lines of what do we do about performance obligations um, in terms of physical performance obligations, construction, obligations to do due diligence or to um, conduct inspections or do, do things that required some kind of physical work. Um, and for the most part, those, um, I think, were the easier questions. In other words, I think the COVID-19 situation or the construction shutdown or the stay-at-home order or another legal impediment to doing business um, became a pretty clear uh, force majeure or act of God event um, and has allowed people to push back those obligations and, and, and get permit, permitted delay. Um, uh, you know, provisions to kick in. Um, some of the trickier situations there were, you know, we do a fair amount of headquarters leasing and you've got a tenant that is moving from one space to the other and a, a landlord needs to deliver on on one property. The tenant needs to move out and perhaps um, uh, perform some surrender obligations on the other. And those have been been quite tricky. And tenants are sometimes worried about what their their holdover obligations are if they cannot either physically get out in time or perform that, that work in time. Um, and for the most part, I think folks have been successful in getting, um, you know, the allowance to have, to have more time, um, of course, with some, some exceptions and some difficult situations. Um, but then the more interesting questions are then, well, we're all at home. Um, we can't do what we normally do, whether we're retailers or office tenants, um, or some industrial, you know, uh, we haven't talked about medical office. The medical office is really hurting as well. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we can't utilize our space. Do we have to pay rent, right? And, that, and, and it is different in, 
in retail and hotel than it is in other other spaces. There are you know there are data centers and there are labs in some cases that are doing very well right now or, or not maybe doing well, but they're very busy and very active. And, and we have a lot of folks in the, in the biotech sector who are who are very active right now. Um, but um, the, the trickier questions come in the, for instance, in the office space, office context where um, folks are asking, well, our, you know, our lease uh, says that we have to pay rent, but we can't, you know, we can't conduct business. I think that, you know, for the, for the most part, office tenants, larger office tenants who are not small businesses are not qualifying for um, local state level relief are, are, are paying their rents, I think, not all of them, but, but I think most of them are. Um, but as time goes on, it gets, it does get trickier. I, I think, you know, I'm relatively optimistic that we'll reopen soon. I think the next set of questions that, you know, that we've already started to see come in are, uh, you know, have to do with differences of opinion about the safety of a given space or the delivery of landlord services and what are the landlords going to be required to do with respect to cleaning and distancing and, and the like. Um, on the the finance side, um, uh, I'd say most of the questions are, relate to um, potential loan defaults, um, either uh, lenders or, or uh, owners uh, calling there. We've been negotiating quite a few uh, pre-negotiation letters, um, just like we are with landlords and tenants, where um, folks are calling their lenders and having conversations with them about uh, um, you know, where things are going and what they think uh, that, you know, might, might be a default situation. And, um, you know, we spent some time, uh, talking to people about what's going to come next and where, what the, you know, if there was going to be a forbearance situation, what that's going to look like. Uh, we've been lucky enough to have some deals that still are going forward. Um, and it took a little while for me to get this, but I was realizing that the deals that were all going forward were, were, were all cash deals or they were deals that, that were, that were equity funded. Um, you know, we have now had a number of deals get uh, called off that were where lenders have have said we're not you know we're not going forward, and I think a lot of lenders are 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 frozen um, right now on the debt side. Um, so you know, um, we'll see where where that goes. Uh, but those are those are some of the early questions that have, have come in. Okay, and um, how do you expect your tenants are going to be uh, successful in getting coverage for some of their losses? through business interruption insurance? Uh, uh, good question. Um, I, you know, for the most part, I think the conventional answer is no. Um, I think many policies, um, and I'm not an insurance lawyer, but I think many policies require a physical loss uh, to the building. Um, there are numerous lawsuits that have been filed around the country um, challenging that, saying that the COVID situation is a physical loss, or challenging it on some other some other grounds. There's a um, there is a bill out. There's a bill that's been filed in Massachusetts to sort of force insurers to cover, uh, despite no physical loss, or or essentially that's what it says. That hasn't gone anywhere yet. And I think most of the folks opining about that think that it's it's not going to go anywhere on constitutional grounds, but I've heard that in other in in Canada, for instance, there are, there's a higher level of claims on business interruption insurance. Um, I think different sectors may see that a little bit differently, and the insurance coverage in different sectors may be a little bit different. But um, you know, liability issues are are uh, are, are key, and 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 certainly there's lots of questions about that. But um, you know, to be determined on the on the on the business interruption front. Okay. All right. Um, all right, I see we have a bunch of questions coming in. Uh, I'm going to go to Michael first and ask them a few questions, and then we'll go down and see the questions that have been asked by the audience, and hopefully uh, everyone will be able to chime in on them. All right, so Michael, um, have you been receiving many calls from your borrowers, and of those calls been them asking for debt relief? And if they have been, what type of debt relief are they being granted? Uh, thank you for the question, and again, thank you for having me on the panel this mo uh, this afternoon, Rick. So, uh, for the most part, our servicing portfolio here in uh, for our office has uh, actually seen very limited uh, relief requests from our borrowers. We're predominantly a uh, life insurance correspondent lender, um, and 
we we received a wave of inquiries, but only you know, about a handful of actual forbearance requests. We've also helped other clients who we've uh, helped place debt capital with with banks. Um, the banks were amongst the groups of lenders who right off the bat, their regulator gave them the most flexibility to work with borrowers, basically giving them allowance to provide borrowers with up to six months of flexibility. Most banks kind of started off with 90 days and you know, kind of kept a little dry powder in reserve. So I think when borrowers talk to banks, they, they found a fairly uh, uh, forgiving reception, welcome ear there. Uh, life insurance companies are a little bit more of a case-by-case -case basis. Um, those who are multifamily borrowers from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, the agencies, they have discovered there is a forbearance program there, but the trade-off is that while your forbearance is outstanding, that you, you agree to uh, suspend any evictions. Um, the borrowers who are having the toughest time right now are those who Got, have capital that was placed with CMBS loans or you know secondary market executions. Okay. Um, are your lenders still lending, or are they too busy putting out fires uh, to actually be putting out more money? Uh, great question. So it's a it's very much a mixed bag. Uh, if you talk to most banks, loan officers, they will say that they are in the market lending. However, the reality is they're, they're really servicing their current clients or they're uh, taking the opportunity to target um, sponsors who they've been wanting to go after for some time. Uh, they're not really as open to looking at truly new business um, from just anybody. If you're wanting to work with a bank today, perhaps one of the ways you can do so to maybe uh, improve the conversation is offer them deposits or other banking business beyond just the loan. Um, life insurance companies, some are in, some are out. Some are still on the sidelines, but then there are some who are quoting and pricing in all honesty over the past couple of weeks keeps improving. Uh, we were fortunate enough to sign up a few deals uh, two weeks ago and they were back in the mid threes. And uh, we saw along our national pipeline, saw another life company deal sign up this morning in the low threes. So corporate bond spreads have continued to compress, which has allowed those lenders who are still in the market to price more aggressively. Uh, on, the, on the multifamily space, agency lenders, they do have treasury floors, but they've consistently dropped those treasury floors and lowered spreads. So we're now seeing, again, pricing back available in the low threes. Good, good rates if you can get the loans out there. If you can get the due diligence done. If you can get the due diligence, um, yes. And there, there are probably some other, depending upon the loan request, the leverage level, there may be some other requirements such as upfront escrows or some additional credit enhancement depending upon the loan. Okay. Now, um, for borrowers that are asking for some relief um, or even ones that aren't asking for relief, I'm hearing about um, banks asking for all kinds of operating information from some of their borrowers, even for loans that are current. Um, have you found that to be the case? And Paul, maybe you can chime in on this too. Um, I think that, that you're going to have various case-by-case uh, -case issues. You're going to have large money center banks behaving differently than regional and local banks. I think that in general, when borrowers are asking for relief, uh, you know, part of the question is going to be, well, show us the hardship. Uh, if it's a hotel property, if it's a non-essential uh, retail center, then I think that that's pretty self-explanatory and lenders are going to be fairly forgiving. If it's a different type of asset, um, I had one client call me recently on a property that was a document storage facility and another client called me on a, on a private golf club. For those types of assets, you're probably going to get, you know, a few more questions about, well, what is the actual hardship? Let's see the financial statements. What's been going on? Okay. Yeah, I, I'd agree with Mike on that. We're seeing um, some of the same. I think for, you know, large part, we're we're still in the in the thick of this and in the thick of finding finding out where pricing is going to come out. I think, you know, I've heard the term we're in price discovery a lot from lenders and they just don't know where they're, they're gonna come out. I think in the 
you know, with some smaller local lenders, we are seeing some refinance transactions go forward. Uh, we're seeing a surprising number of super high-end residential stuff um, get uh, under contract, and, and, and it appears like it'll get financed at relatively low LTVs, and that's been interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, we're really still in the middle of it. We're, we're, we're early days, I think, in terms of those negotiations. Our, from our standpoint, we have uh, just local lenders, regional lenders uh, on our portfolio, and that's made a big difference. We've had uh, open communication for many, many weeks, um, and there'll be some creative solutions, um, some flexibility, and uh, to be determined how it ends up, but we're, we're very pleased to have local lenders and the ability to pick the phone up and, and, and get right to the person. How about you, Sandy? Do you have any communication with any lenders? So we've we've done a um, we were very proactive at the outside outset of reaching out to all of our investors actually and lenders and just kind of letting them know we were um, reaching out to we were kind of monitoring our collections um, and rents and we could stay in touch with them. So at this point, we haven't had to make any modifications that I'm aware of. Um, but I do know that that's, you know, this is this is an evolving landscape here. And well, we've heard from some brokers that the debt markets have opened back up on the on the multifamily side. But then I've heard from other players um, in the in the industry that um, we're trying to um, finance uh, um, new construction deals, something that was supposed to break ground pretty recently. And um, the, the yields had gone down because the um, cost had gone up and the, the debt pulled out and their equity was sitting on the sidelines kind of waiting to see if they could um, get some money out of the construction cost. Um, so that, that's kind of where, where we're at. I think it's too soon to tell for the most part, I mean, we underwrite an amount, a certain amount of vacancy and delinquency on a regular, you know, on, on every deal. And multifamily has not been hit, hit as hard as the retail piece um, has. And most of our deals, for the most part, even the mixed use ones, have, you know, less than 10% of the revenues are generated off of the retail. So we're, we're fairly protected um, for, for now. I mean, if this continues for quite some time, I should also say we've done a lot of sensitivity analysis internally on our existing assets and our development assets relative to what happens in the market when rents start to um, die down and potentially plateau, and then also um, how long it takes to come back and what that looks like. Okay. All right, so let's, um, we have a few questions that have been put out by the uh, uh, group here, so let's see. Uh, answer a few of those. Um, can, can everyone, all the panelists, if you scroll down, do you, can you see the questions that were asked? It's on the Q&A. Okay, so let's just go through a couple of these. Um, so Rick, I, I looked at a couple of them and, and one of the themes that okay. seemed to come up was about collecting rent. So there were several questions about whether landlords are reaching out to tenants and being proactive or if they're waiting for tenants to uh, come to them first to ask for relief. Um, people were also curious about if, if leases were contingent on retailers generating revenue or what the right approach is for collecting missed payments in April and May. Um, so, you know, maybe the panel can address, you know, some of those type of questions. Excellent. Fire away, guys. So I'm happy to jump in with kind of our experience on the retail side and the resident side. So we've, um, We've been very open to folks who approach us. Um, we haven't gone out, like if, if you go out and say we're open for rent relief, um, every single person's gonna show up on your door, doorstep. Um, so we haven't gone that far, but for every group um, on the resident side, when they approach, we again, talk to them about what is their story to understand it um, and then craft something that works for them. And it's the same thing on the retail side. Um, we had an example of a, a retailer um, in a, we, we own a small industrial asset um, and ha that has a storage use and our, our most um, stable tenant approached at the outset and asked for three months free rent. And we said, you know, we're happy to talk about rent relief. And we did a deferral. We actually gave them a deferral of 50% for the first month for April and said, but we want to do this on a month by month basis, right? We're not, we're not giving people blanket rent relief. We're, we're trying to stay relevant with what's happening. Um, when that ask came, it was, 
prior to any of the COVID relief programs. So we, we also, I mean, we're a small business too. And every one of the groups on here, you know, we have people to pay. So we, and investors that are looking for, for not even, it's, it's not even about the return so much as they're looking to make sure they're not losing money. So the, the approach I would say is if, if, if a retailer or a tenant approaches, we're, we're open to the conversation. And this is what I've heard from folks, but it's not a blanket one size fits all relief scenario. And, and I noticed somebody asked the question about deferral versus relief. I would say at this point where we're, we are talking deferrals only, um, you know, if this continues for a lot longer, I think that conversation changes, but again, it's too early to call the ball on that. Curious Vin, what your experience is. Yeah, so, you know, we've had some solutions that involved um, kind of dipping into a tenant's security deposits and then allowing them, this is obviously on the retail side, and then allowing them to replenish that over some extended period of time um, um, seemed like a good solution to us. Um, we, um, uh, we've we also been, you know, uh, talking to some tenants about some deferrals. Um, one of the things we said really early on, kind of first week of April was, um, and, and you know, this might come across as harsh, but we have our bills to pay and our lenders to pay, uh, was kind of the, the cost, the price of admission, you know, the cost of discussing something was April rent. You pay April rent, uh, we're happy to get into discussions about May and June and we'll see how long this goes on. Um, you know, you dip into your reserves because then we'll be dipping into ours as well and, and, and our lender probably plays a role here. Um, but, you know, don't just say I can't pay when, you know, it just it just happened weeks ago. You know, we, we, we entered into a lease with you based upon how strong you are, you were, um, and, and financially, and, and therefore we expect to be able to, you know, handle some of this um, up front. But I think that that sentiment is also echoed on the lender side as well. I think a lot of the requests for relief also came with the caveat of, you know, make the April mortgage payment and then we can discuss what's going to happen going forward thereafter um, and showing also what types of agreements the landlord is doing uh, with the tenants, you know, again, that, that shared uh, proof of hardship. Um, and then I would suggest any landlords out there who are working with their tenants who have uh, commercial mortgages on their properties, particularly if it's a institutional lender, uh, your assignment of leases and rents may require you to get lender approval of a lease modification. So um, if you're going to have those conversations, you know, reach out to your lender right away. They are being flooded with a bunch of requests uh, for approvals of these types of lease modifications or, and then also deferral requests on the loans. So uh, best to get them involved as soon as possible as well, so that right. you can provide timely feedback to your tenant. And it's worth noting that, I mean, at least uh, part of our MO has been, it, there's a difference between deferring or abating rent for a quality tenant that, that is going to be here in six months. Um, kind of giving somebody a lifeline to extend that is not uh, a viable business, and we've had a couple of those scenarios. Um, is a different story. So, you know, we're not asking everybody to show our financials, but are their financials? But if somebody shows up and is like, I absolutely can't pay and it's April, um, which we had a scenario like that, um, we really, that was a red flag because it was too soon to not be able to make uh, the rent payment, um, especially when they were asking for a lot of relief. So I think it goes back to every situation is unique and, um, you, you got to fit the, the response to the situation. And, and it also, it's both sides of the coin. It's the lender, investor, the landlord, and the tenant. All those parties have to be in, the, in alignment. Gabe, I want to ask a question here. Um, we, we have some great questions coming up um, that the audience has asked. Is it possible to extend this past two o'clock? I mean, uh, past three o'clock, or is that a drop dead uh, time? Yeah, if, if the panelists are, are free to stick around, um, we're, we're happy to keep going. And, you know, we understand if, if folks have a, you know, three o'clock engagement they have to get to, then, you know, thank you so much for joining us today. And we know you, you might have to excuse yourself. But yes, please feel free to, to stay and, and we'll keep the discussion going. Another, you know, maybe another few, because I looked at the, some of the questions and the questions seem to be great. And, you know, like to get to at least some of those from the, 
from uh, some answers from the panelists. And of course, before all the panelists go, I need to make a plug for my students and say, before you guys all uh, chime off, I want to know uh, your thoughts about how do my students get jobs uh, in this environment if they are really interested and motivated in working in real estate. So that's a personal plug from me for you know my my form my students and as you guys most of you are former students of mine you can understand that plug. So let's go on then if we can. Mm -hmm. So Rick, so there's, it, it, Rick, there's a question from uh, Clay about valuations um, and, and kind of what the immediate impact would be on valuations. I listened to a webinar this morning from Spencer Levy from CBRE, their economist, you know, and, and he was saying there's probably a five to cent, five to ten percent drop in valuations immediately, uh, but that that'll start to kind of come back again, right? And a lot of it, uh, Paul, you know, referred to the term earlier of price discovery, right? The fact that deals or transactions are down by two thirds, you know, transaction volume down by 70% just has everyone kind of wondering where is pricing right now, right? Uh, luckily, rates have stayed low and that's gonna help. Uh, but there's, there, of course, there's an, an immediate impact. And the question is, and then how quickly does that come back? My two cents. So I, I and I would, um, uh, Rick, you kind of put me onto this earlier in the week. There's, there's been a lot of webinars um, uh, Barry Sternlich, uh, this one from Spencer Levy this morning, uh, time well spent, uh, each of them probably less than an hour. Um, so, you know, how does one use their time right now? It's a lot of research, a lot of those, uh, great time to do continuing ed for all those who have licenses out there. So just keep them busy. Um, Keith, uh, maybe answer your question a little bit in terms of folks coming out of school soon. Um, looking in, in real estate. Um, number one, I'm pretty optimistic um, that we'll come out of this. And I think that, you know, the, I think that, you know, as a, a human race right now, we're pretty darn good at, um, at figuring out diseases and cures for them. And I think this one we will solve and that'll, it'll take some time, but we'll come out of it. And I, and so I don't think that you know, for instance, I don't think that retail is dead. I mean, it's going to be hurting for a while. It has been hurting, but, um, it, you know, it will come back. I, I do think, though, if I were coming out of school now, that I'd, I'd probably try to be focused on what is going to change based on the current situation that we're in and um, where are those areas that are going to be hot. And I think that pharma uh, and, and biotech and, and, and the medical field is changing, you know, so much, and there's a lot of growth in that space that that's going to continue to require uh, real estate needs. And I think those are the companies that are going to be, you know, expanding as we, as we come out of this. Um, and there's plenty of other areas where people are going to need to get ahead of figuring out how do we all work together, um, you know, in a post pandemic world and people will be more cognizant of um, needing to deal with these situations, uh, you know, as we go forward. Um, and there's going to be, you know, there's still, there'll be some clear, clear winners and losers, losers. And I think it's worth, um, you know, it's really worth tracking those. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. I uh, I'll also comment on that. I, I guess we just don't know. I mean, we don't know how long this is going to last and what's going on. I do agree. I don't know if it was Paul or Vin who said that this will be fixed at some point in time. Um, I was on a webinar this morning and a couple of people were talking about, I don't think, that they don't think anybody really knows anything except for that once a vaccine is found and things kind of quote unquote go back to normal, then I think that's just what will happen. It'll go back to normal. And if you're coming out of college, I'd advise trying to get a job as an analyst somewhere so you can really learn the ropes. And once you have that underneath you, you can do a lot of different things in real estate but I just don't know when the normal will be. You know, is that a, a vaccine in nine or 12 months um, or longer? Or our business is going to take a leap of faith and open up before then? You know, I, I just don't know. Um, but I do think that this, that's the one thing I think is that this is a temporary situation. You know, I've been through some other downturns in the economy, and those are definitely um, down, 
turns that were temporary. And I don't think people were afraid because you knew the economy always does bounce back. But this is one where, you know, what if bad things happen in three months and we get a second wave and people are dying again, we're all into this. I, I just don't think people have that answer. And to me, it's really, it's really curious. I think it's, it comes back to the testing. We really, really, really need to get the testing going. Expand that. Testing and tracking will allow us to build confidence, you know, uh, of getting back to work. Um, um, vaccine will take a while uh, from everything I read, but we really need to roll out testing as much as possible. Um, and we will bounce back. I mean, Keith, I came out of your class in 1990. Um, a few uh, years ago. A few years ago. I believe Bob McCullough might be on this call as well. Paul's former teammate, my classmate. Tough time to come out and want to get into real estate. 1991 was the graduating year. But, um, you know, to the students, it's just keep plugging away. Um, um, honestly, don't wait for the perfect job. Get yourself out there. Um, take a job. And, and if it's not the field you want to be in, that was my situation. I went back to BU and took night school courses in real estate just to keep learning and networking. Uh, every one of these students can join all of the organizations for practically nothing. Uh, ULI and NAOP, and they should all be members. I mean, it's really, really inexpensive, and they should just get out there and network as much as possible when we can, when we're back to that. So I absolutely second what Vin is saying. I also came out of BU in 92, right into the throes of a recession, and um, shared earlier that I ended up with an internship my um, spring semester senior year that I saw posted outside someone's office and that turned into a job at the State Parks Department doing planning which led me here so you know kind of any job is a good job um, especially if you're learning good project management skills good analytical skills um, and networking is key and people have time right pay attention to these webinars if you don't have access to them figure out how to get access through professor munsell or somebody else um oh yeah but also the the bus. Thanks, Andy. right <laughs> um but also linkedin um there's some real interesting thought leadership going on on linkedin with um people sharing really interesting articles because one of the things that um people are just starting to talk about is the day after tomorrow is the day we go back to work, right, in some fashion. But the day after the day after tomorrow is what have we learned from this experience and, and how does it shape the work of the future? Are people working from home more? Uh, is there more staggered starts? Um, are there more staggered starts in schools? How do the schools and daycares layer in with um, our transportation network and work scheduling? And are there some lessons from this experience that help us transform the way we use infrastructure and some of our infrastructure capacity issues? And so there's, I feel like there's going to be some opportunities to participate in those kinds of conversations. And, you know, again, to Vin's point, organizations like NAOP and ULI and REFA often lead some of those conversations. Um, and so you can get yourself in a position where you're meeting people by raising your hand and saying, yeah, I can help organize that panel or, yeah, let me see who we can get to speak. Those are great ways to build your network when you're just starting out. And there are jobs. You just need to be tenacious. I want to ask uh, on the same venue, uh, Michael, because um, you're kind of where the rubber meets the road when it comes to, to uh, lenders and equity um, personnel. Do you see the maybe foreclosure or forbearance uh, increasing and potential opportunities for employment there? Opportunities for employment in a workout shop? Yes. Uh, that's an interesting question, Keith. Uh, I suppose banks could use bodies, but I think when it comes to workouts, they generally are looking for people with a bit of experience. Yeah, okay. But it's possible. Uh, you know, certainly there is, I mean, right now there is a wave of, uh, of requests. I mean, I don't know if the PPP loan process are asking for internship help right now, but, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. All right. Thank you. Maybe, yeah, I agree. I think that yeah, most workout people I know. Employees or how to get a job. Um, 
Rick, do you want to take a look at some of the additional questions? I mean, maybe we can spend a yeah, few minutes. I was looking through a few while we were on here. So, and a few people had questions about, since a lot of people are doing, uh, you know, working virtually or remotely using uh, Zoom like we're doing and other stuff, how that's going to affect real estate. And most of the questions, I've seen like four or five questions on there about that. And most of them are kind of leaning to, isn't that going to require less space from people? But again, as I said, I've been on probably a webinar a day. And I've been hearing from uh, users and landlords that it's actually the opposite. While for short term, this is good, getting on Zoom calls and webinars and talking and stuff. When you're two parents home with two or three little kids running around, you, you just can't get the work done that you want to get done. Um, plus, people like seeing other people, and you like meeting at the water cooler and saying, hey, what do you think about that deal, or how can we make this happen? And when you're home, if, you know, maybe you're with your family, but you're probably not talking, you know, too much business. Um, and the other thing regarding space needs I've heard is, you know, now where they're saying, you know, pe people were in cubicles and everyone gets whatever, 100 and... 25 or 150 square feet that that's all going to change that those people are going to need twice as much space. So even if you are rotating people who are coming into your office or aren't having as many people come in, um, you're going to need the same or more amount of space because you're going to need more space in between, you know, people who are working there. And the other thing that I've heard from a lot of conference calls are that, you know, for years and years, all we heard was everyone wants to move downtown. Urban's where it's at. People want to be there. And now we're hearing from a lot of people that are like, maybe we want to work in the suburbs where we can probably get a little more space and have some amenities close to us and get more space, maybe at a more reasonable per square foot thing. So that could be an interesting phenomenon that all of a sudden all this urban growth is going to be not saying people are going to move out to tertiary markets, but maybe, you know, close in suburban areas, such as Malden, which would be a great place. Rick, Rick, Spencer Levy spoke to that this morning and said it might be that you need additional locations. So you still might have that downtown headquarters, but maybe something that's, you know, 10, 15, 20 miles outside in the burbs and the kind of inner ring uh, might give you some flexibility, some real resiliency if one office gets closed versus the other. And, um, so I think there's a lot to be worked out, uh, over time. Exactly. Oh, it's, it's the old adage for real estate location, location, location. Um, whatever happens with floor plates or space sizes, whether it's expansion or contraction, whenever you have an opportunity for one property type to, that's going to change, uh, it's just like, there's a reason why 495, that beltway, it's always the last to recover and the first to go down. When opportunities arise in other better located areas, those properties fill up first. Those properties it can adapt the quickest. So, I mean, is a well-located piece of real estate will still outperform and will be able to adapt. All right. Anybody I think we have time else? Time for maybe one more question. Okay. Abe, you want to hop back in here? Yeah, I was going to say, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, I don't know if there was one that, that stuck out to the panelists. I saw I about construction. Go, uh, a, a quick one. I saw a question about construction and how we're handling that. So obviously, our, uh, uh, we're, we're fortunate. We, we've had a lot of construction over the last five years, but we're, we're down to just a handful of projects right now. Uh, you know, they're, they're on temporary suspension. Uh, we made a decision not to just kind of you know, terminate the contracts because uh, those are awfully tough to then restart up and they can be very expensive. So uh, our hope is that the CM or the general contractor is able to receive some uh, payroll protection plan loan funding uh, to help us offset, you know, what would otherwise be extended general conditions. Um, and so uh, kind of to be worked out, but the, uh, at least from our standpoint, the idea of not kind of terminating was that we would uh, be kind of first in line to get back in and wrap the job up. Um, they can be quite messy if you, know, if you terminate. So, one thought. 
How about you, Sandy? Do you have any construction jobs going on now? We do. We and it's it's a different story in different markets, right? Depending on um, kind of what the municipal and local leadership has um, has uh, prescribed, right? So we didn't have anything underway in Boston, so we didn't have anything that got totally shut down. Um, we're in the throes of punch list at our big project in Malden, um, so really desperately trying to finish that up. Um, and there's full protections in place, you know, and monitoring, temperature taking every day. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a lot of extra work for the contractor, and truthfully, they've approached on, you know, there's a lot of added cost to getting done now. And so that, that becomes a conversation. We have two projects that are nearing delivery in the Washington DC market and you know those are going pretty much full steam ahead but again with a lot of protections in place. So you know it, it, for us it's trying to get as much done as we can. We haven't started anything new um, ourselves but as I mentioned earlier we had two retailers start start their build out in the midst of this and they're working under um, kind of on the job site that our GC is managing. And it's been interesting because usually the coordination there is more about, you know, plumbing and mechanical and, you know, kind of the facilities and infrastructure. And here it's, it's much more, um, everybody's much more focused on is everybody following the protocol, right? Because, um, other jobs in the market, you know, a job across the street from us got shut down because they weren't observing the right protocols. So it's, it's a very tenuous time, right, where, you know, stuff that, you know, people wouldn't be so attentive to um, is, is mission critical today to success and staying um, an active job site. If you don't mind, I'd like to follow up on a quick question. Actually, sure. Sandy, for you and Paul and Vin, uh, are you seeing that contractors might be asking for additional compensation due to delays in construction? Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. And, and people are talking about force majeure clauses and whether this qualifies and, um, you know, pandemic isn't often listed, um, right? That, that's, it will be from now on. Exactly. And, and truthfully, I mean, we don't have pandemic listed in purchase and sale contracts either. And that's another component. So, um, you know, this, this is all braving new ground, at least for us, I'm assuming. And, and from what I'm hearing, a lot of our, you know, colleagues in the space as well. Yeah, we're seeing the same. And, and, you know, there are a lot of other, well, even if there's not a pandemic coverage, you have other um, things getting in the way of things that a contractor uh, needs to do uh, or causing delays, um, you know, especially around New England and uh, tri-state area. We, we're seeing construction proceed actually in lots of other states and um, 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 less of a slowdown, uh, but there are, you know, there are carrying costs, there are costs of that delay, um, and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, folks who are who are hurting, so there, there is going to, there, there will be a cost to that. All right. All right. I think back. That, that means we're over. I'm back. That's right. <laughs> well, I, I think this was really wonderful. Uh, Michael, Paul, Vin, Sandy, thank you so much for your wonderful insight and to Rick and Keith for, for guiding us through this discussion today. Um, we also want to thank you for joining us, uh, yeah, for coming to our webinar and uh, for, for your great questions to our panelists. Um, special thanks to our donors for supporting BU and for supporting programs like this. Uh, so you'll see in the chat, I've just listed two upcoming events that may interest you. Uh, this Thursday, April 30th at 1130 AM Eastern time, uh, we'll be hosting a discussion called Data and Insights in Luxury Marketing. It's part of our Questrom Insights series. And the discussion features Alan Beck, who is president of uh, the Beauty Bridge, as well as uh, Patricia Hambrick, uh, who's the senior lecturer of marketing uh, at the Question School of Business. Um, later that afternoon at four o'clock, we'll also be hosting um, BU, uh, the BU Initiative on Cities uh, called After COVID-19, Rebuilding Resilient Cities. And uh, that's hosted by Sandra Galeo, uh, Dean of our School of uh, Public Health. So if you're interested in these or other programs, you can find all of them on the web at bu.edu slash alumni slash events. Uh, so thanks again for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to seeing all of you at a future BU event. All right. Take care. Thank, Thank you, well. everybody. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hi, guys. Thank you very yeah. much for all, all of your, your great input.